All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And it is sunny today. We had a little bit of rain recently, but it's back to being sunny. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Neve Hannon, who is in probably a bit more of a rainy, cold Ireland. Yeah, definitely. And dark right now because we're on a yeah. completely different time zone. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yes, 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 indeed. Um, you know, and I obviously, Neve is back in my home country. She's in based in Greystones, which is just outside Dublin, not far from not far from where I grew up. And uh, Neve is a chartered psychologist uh, and known as the so uh, the soulful psychologist. I like that a lot. That's a that's a cool one. And uh, and works with individuals and organizations. And what we're going to talk about today is it's a really fascinating subject. It's I read some time a, a long time ago, um, Neve, something from Psychology Today, which said I think it had a, a percentage of like eighty percent of our daily self-talk is negative or something like that anyway it was a really really high percentage so i'm going to talk about how we can build lasting confidence and change your self-talk and and create a you know, more positive attitude because obviously you know self-talk can can be very harmful if it's negative all the time absolutely uh, you know I, I suppose the way i would often talk about it is that um you know, it's a, it's a lot how we use our mind because self-talk is how we talk to ourselves in our own mind, really. Um, and our mind is like a, a sharp tool, really. It can be used for us or against us. And when we use it against ourselves, it's actually very dangerous. Um, and, you know, to the extent that we, we can harm or, you know, or, or more seriously hurt ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. And we can hurt others with it as well. So self-talk is really how you talk to yourself inside your own mind. And the number one step really is awareness, because we do it so automatically, John, that most people aren't even aware that they're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so the, the the probably the easier way to become aware is is noticing how you're feeling, because we we often have awareness of our feelings. We may not have good language around our emotions. We may not be good at expressing them, but we usually know whether we're feeling good or feeling bad or whether we're angry or sad or happy or whatever it might be. Um, mm -hmm. So when we're feeling bad, um, uh, and particularly if something has happened that maybe triggered that. So maybe if we feel like we've failed at something or we've made a mistake or we've done something wrong or we've had a negative interaction with somebody and we're feeling the effects, that's the time to really check into, OK, what am I saying to myself right now? And is this useful? So that little question is a very yeah. helpful filter, really, to to consider, you know, to use in any context, really. OK, is what I'm doing with my mind is what I'm saying to myself. Is it helpful right now? Is it useful? Where is it getting me? Because if it's just getting you into a negative spiral, then that's not helpful. Um, yeah. No, I just, I just want to say I, I love that. I love that concept of saying to yourself, is this useful? Because that's. That's uh, that seems very simple but powerful because normally you're like, oh, change, change when I'm, oh, come on, like I need to snap out of this. But to say to yourself, is that useful? That that just seems like a really powerful tool. Yeah. So I I, I think when we talk about thinking positively as well, we have to almost have you know the small print underneath because it's not all. It's not about just um, thinking positively, happy, clappy stuff. Um, mm. You know, it's really important, and I say this as a, somebody who was a therapist for 20 years, it's really important to to feel and to process our negative emotions too. Mm -hmm. um, they, they all have a place. We're going to have different moods throughout the day. We're going to have different emotions throughout the day. And, you know, if something has happened that has brought you into sadness or grief or, or guilt or anything, any of those kind of feelings that we tend to think of as negative, um, it's important to process that and make, make sense of that. However, very often things are happening in our world which others might not measure as negative but we're misinterpreting them we're we're adding a, a layer of meaning to them and, and and making a whole lot up in our own mind which we're then going back around in circles with possibly on an angry rant or you know questioning and doubting ourselves continuously with our self talk and and digging ourselves into a hole and and to me that's not useful 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, whereas, you know, if, if something difficult has happened, if there's been a loss, whether it's financial, whether it's a person, whether it's, you know, relational, then the mood or, or the, the sadness or the grief that you experience, th- that is helpful to process, actually. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I no, that's a that's a great clarification. No, I do, I I totally I totally agree with uh, totally agree with that. And it is isn't it funny because I mean when things are really affecting you and you know negative in your head, but there's also kind of a physiological and you got your you know your body can also tell you that things aren't right right now or or that you need to figure out what's going on. So it's not just your mind, but your body will help you too. Absolutely, 100%. Um, And again, in the Western world, we often tend to be not so aware of what's happening in our body. Mm -hmm. So if I said, you know, if I ask most people, okay, where do you feel anxiety in your body? Most people can answer that because anxiety is very physical. We either know that we feel it in our, maybe something sitting on our chest or for Mm -hmm. for a lot of people, it's like a knot in their stomach or butterflies or feeling sick or shaky or whatever it might be. Um, Whereas if I said to you, okay, where do you feel happiness in your body or where do you feel sadness in your body that can be more difficult to Mm. place to tune in with so you're absolutely right i mean the emotions have a seat in the body when we're feeling something there's something happening in the body and there's a huge connection of course between our thoughts our feelings and our behavior and and the the cognitive behavioral therapy model has a has a nice model to explain that but the idea really is that you know if you're thinking a certain way then that's going to impact on how you're feeling. And that also has, you know, an impact on what's happening in your body. So if if I'm thinking, for example, oh, my God, I've got to have this in tomorrow. I don't have it done. I don't know what to do. I'm thinking anxious thoughts. It's going to, you know, kick off um, an, an anxiety response in my body and potentially even that emergency fight or flight response. So your mind is starting to, your brain kind of realizes, okay, something's up here, something's not quite right. Let's dump a whole load of chemicals in. And so we start to release our stress hormones and then we start to notice them in our body. And it's like, oh my God, my heart is beating really fast or um, I can't breathe or I'm shaking or what's happening to me. And, and of course, we know that at its extreme, we can send ourselves into panic with that. So a lot happens in the body. But but a lot of the time, even with stress, yeah. you know, people aren't aware that they have anything going on until, you know, they're in their 40s or 50s and fall off the edge with a heart attack or a stroke or something. They never noticed any of the build up to that. Mm-hmm. So how, how when you when you work with people in organizations, how do you help people start to notice what's going on and really start to pay attention to it? Because as you say, I mean, we tend to and let's face it, in, in Ireland, certainly my generation, we we're always very good at pushing everything aside and going, oh, you know, I don't want to deal with that now. So I'll just put that to the one side. So how do you help people actually be able to interpret it without maybe, you know, getting too um, internally focused? Yeah, so I, it's a good question. I suppose, you know, there are different approaches and uh, mm-hmm. mindfulness can be one really helpful approach for building awareness, first of all, and secondly, acceptance. So it's, it, you know, if, if you can, it's not just about mindfulness, it's not just about the meditation that you do. That's the, the formal part of it, but the informal approach part, uh, and really that's the other, you know, 23 and a half hours in the day that you're not meditating um, is really about let's see if I can begin to accept whatever it is that I'm experiencing. So if we can accept that, you know, we're going to have a, a, you know, a whole mixture of emotions in the day and, and be bringing our awareness to those emotions and, and bringing our awareness to our thoughts. So The way I explain it, and and a lot of it is helping people to understand how their mind works and then giving them tools to, you know, either change mindsets, look at different interpretations and perspective, um, or, you know, giving them tools to come out of the busy mind. So when we're in thought, when we're when we're feeling, you know, emotionally aroused in, in a negative way, for example, if we're you know, wound up angry or, mm-hmm. uh, or stressed, overwhelmed, anxious, any of those kind of emotions. At that moment, we're 100 percent in thought. We're thinking we're caught up in that. We're believing that even if you are uh, come into awareness for a moment that for that moment, you're not in thought anymore. You're the awareness of that thought. So there's a degree of separation. Mm-hmm. And when we 
practice that that empowers us to step outside and to kind of ask a question well it's what i'm it's, it's what needs thinking is that helpful there or you know i mean if, if i'm in bed at night and i'm going through an angry rant it's like well, that's not helpful i'm supposed to be going to sleep right now you know <laughs> and, and the context but again that question is really helpful too yeah. And and what you just I just wrote down there a couple of things. But one of the things I wanted to come back to is the busy mind concept, because we, we live in a we live in a very strange culture today where we are, we have our stupid phones and all this other stuff. And we have we're bombarded nonstop. You know, you're on we're on our zombie scrolling on Instagram or TikTok, but not me on TikTok, but other people. Um, and. And we're doing, it's almost like we've set up this culture to never allow you be with your own thoughts, never allow you to be aware, just to be distracted all of the time. So, yeah. So how do you combat that in people? Because, I mean, people now, you know, we're seeing kids where they have to get a dopamine hit every so often, like by zombie scrolling through TikTok or whatever. So how, how do we get people to be mindful and aware in a culture that's sort of telling you, eh, you don't need to pay attention to anything because here's somebody dancing. Yes, it's, it's <laughs> that's probably the, the, the challenge of this generation um, because you're absolutely right. Kids are, they could spend, you know, uh, they could spend seven hours on TikTok straight if they were less. Um, and it's very addictive because it is always the promise of the next hit. And it's not necessarily getting the hit. It's that kind of you're, you're hooked on the, the promise of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's probably also why things like mindfulness have have come up in popularity, too, because we need that counterbalance, you know, take, whether it's TikTok, any of the social media platforms yeah. that always switched on this has been accompanied by a giant rise in anxiety, stress and depression, you know, and and so there's a there's an obvious connection there it, we're not designed to live in this mind all the time we yeah. are much more than mind and the more we can step out of mind actually and connect into who we really are uh, that at source beyond mind then the more we live to our potential the happier we are you know to the, the, the greater meaning we find, the greater sense of purpose we find, you're not going to find purpose in your phone. You're not going to find that mm -hmm. meaning in your phone. In fact, people think that they're going to find connection in their phone, but mm -hmm. in fact, the more connected we are online, the more disconnected people are feeling. And that's yep. what the research show. So, and many would say that actually a lot of our of the biggest problems of, of this generation are down to disconnection, disconnect mm. from self and disconnection from each other. Yeah. And, and uh, as I was reading recently, like epidemics of loneliness. And uh, so we've got all these ways of connecting, but then we're we're, you know, feeling lonely because we're not really connecting. It's funny. I was actually at the first in-person conference I've been to, I think, since before covid uh, in new york uh, the last couple of days and it was it was funny like everybody was the same every you know when we're having dinner and all that you know, everybody was kind of very upbeat because we were like con you know we were there and connecting we weren't nobody was on their phones we were talking and chatting and it was it was a real it was a really it was a real stark contrast if you like to how we've been living but how a lot of people are continuing to live to be honest i don't mean like going in person but just still staying digital as opposed to you know getting out there breathing some air yeah and it is about i think you know finding the balance um mm -hmm. I mean, what what you're seeing here in my this is my little room. This you know this this has become where I live now, <laughs> on five days a week. Uh, and most of my work has moved online now. Um, and to to counterbalance that for me, because I'm self employed, um, I joined a local women's network that so I can mm -hmm. meet other women who are in the same situation. Um, and I you know I I I am maybe more choosy about where what in-person work I will do. Um, mm. It doesn't make sense to be on a motorway sure. for half a day. Yeah. Um, so we have we, we can have the beauty of both if we're careful, but we have to go into this with our eyes wide open. And, and I talked a lot about this during the lockdowns, kind of like we need to remember um, and hold on to this, and, you know, because it will get busy again. And that's what's happened this year. And I'm really seeing yeah. that since maybe September 
people, you know, the world has opened back up and it's it seems to have just accelerated. The pace is even faster than it was pre-COVID, if that's even possible. And mm. because it's almost now like the productivity that we can have online by having yeah. back-to-back meetings is now expected when you're in office as well. Um, yeah. so we do so, need to really look ourselves with that and, and I can bring, again, bring conscious awareness to it and, and, and make better choices. Yeah, no, it has. I mean, I would agree. I mean, I think it, the, the pace is frenetic right now. And uh, so uh, because because of that, then it becomes obviously more important for you to be able to step outside, uh, step outside a little and, and, and separate yourself. And, and as I was saying earlier, I mean, self-awareness is really the key to so many things. Right. Um, but the journey for, to self-awareness, it's not an easy one. It's not one that people undertake kind of naturally. And uh, for most of us, unfortunately, probably undertake it, you know, much later in life than we really should have. But there you go. You live and learn. But um, how do you how do you help that uh, that journey to self-awareness? Because that, that can be a really tough journey, because sometimes we don't like to learn things about ourselves. Yes. And it, it's kind of like you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. You, you can't make somebody go on that journey. Um, mm-hmm. And. Uh, you know, I think I, for me, it's probably been a journey of a, of my lifetime so far, and will mm-hmm. continue to the day I die. It's 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 something I'm heavily invested in and, and motivated to do. Um, and still, um, and still, there's parts of me that, of course, I have you know plenty of resistance and uh, avoidance behavior too, mm-hmm. um, because none of us really like going into um, the difficult emotions or or hearing stuff about ourselves. Mm-hmm. So, self awareness is. It, it's it underlies all the work I do when when it was counseling and now for coaching um, for any of my group programs it really you know when I'm working with people it's about the inner game because if you can work on the inner game then your outer game will naturally change mm-hmm. and very often and, and and maybe that's the motivator there for people to understand that if you want something to change in your outside world as most people will have a list of things you know a list of goals <laughs> that they'd like or things they'd like to be different you know we spend maybe 90 percent of our effort trying to change the outside world and get our ducks lined up in a row and and even when all those ducks are lined up in a row it still only contributes to maybe be 10% of your long-term happiness. So instead of spending 90% of your time on that 10%, you'd be better turning that attention inwards, um, mm. paying a little bit more attention to, you know, who you are, what's important to you, connecting into yourself, learning to be still, learning to have quiet time, you know, working on self-acceptance, self-compassion. Um, all, all of that journey will give you the, the much greater percentage of the happiness, mm-hmm. health, uh, wealth, potentially well-being, though, you know, and it, it really impacts on your relationships as well. So mm-hmm. every brings you benefits when you do that work. And, and I work primarily with, with nowadays with women in leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, and and again, my focus is always on that, that kind of inner right. game to begin with, because when you work on you, then that impacts on your leadership. It impacts on your mm-hmm. outer game. It impacts on what you create and and on the people be, around you. So there's that real, you know, you turn that pebble into the lake and, and the ripples come out. Yeah, you know, and, it, and it's fascinating too. It's, um, you know, the, the last thing I just uh, mentioned is the imposter syndrome. Uh, and I think that's the one that I, I come across and I, I hear more than ever with people now is, you know, they, this imposter syndrome really, um, <clears throat> really manifests itself, you know, in a big way. And it's funny because you were saying you do um, a lot of work with women leaders. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who, who work with women. And one of the interesting things uh, <clears throat> about women is, um, you know, if you see a job posting, right, and there's mm-hmm. 10 requirements, right, men will often go, oh, I don't really have any of these. Oh, maybe I have this one. I'll apply. You know, whereas a woman would say, well, I only have six out of the eight. I'm not qualified. Um, And and so that kind of so those are the kind of things and the imposter syndromes and stuff that we need to to overcome in in order to move forward. A hundred percent. And and maybe that's one of the reasons that I I particularly like working with women. I Mm -hmm. feel, you know, 
I think we're at a time when there, there's a lot of change needed and it's it's happening slowly. Um, you know, there's a lot out there about e equality, equal pay, you know, um, but we've lived in a in what has been a patriarchal society for thousands and thousands of years. So there's an awful lot that's so ingrained um, that I think that's partially why it's the female who, you know, won't apply unless they tick all the boxes. And there's also that unconscious bias that even if they did apply, if if, you know, the man beside her had the same, you know, qualifications or whatever experience, he's still more likely to get it. Um, so uh, I just I just think we have a long way to go. Um, and it's about empowering women to to still be bring the feminine into the workplace, because I think what we've seen often is women being helped to be nearly more masculine than the men and more competitive than the men in order to compete in the in you know a, a, a male dominated company for example or or sector um and that's not necessarily helpful so it, the, whole, the whole world right we need the, the feminine to be valued and to be heard I mean, it's half the population mm -hmm. <laughs> we're doing the work um but <laughs> just not it's just not it's often work that's not valued and appreciated or paid well um mm. so yeah there, you're getting me onto a pet subject there um, <laughs> it's not it's not about male versus female it's sure I think it, it's more about you know for for men too they you know it's the feminine traits and masculine traits both are needed mm -hmm. in the world yeah um and and when we oppress one and you know and and put the other up on a, on a pedestal, it doesn't do anybody a service actually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And and so you know if we can if we can bring the feminine more into the world more powerfully and and, and give that equal power. I mean, well, we know for example in in on boards, if it's if it's a fifty fifty gender based board, um, that's the most successful company. Whereas mm -hmm. if it's if it's too much of one or too much of the other, then that that company yeah. doesn't tend to be successful. We need that diversity. We need to include um, yeah. all voices, all voices, and value them. So I think there is a slow shift happening. Um, but it, it, I mean, for me in a historical context, it makes sense, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, like, sure. Um, I mean, John, we're both from Ireland. In in the seventies, there was the marriage ban. If when a woman got married, mm -hmm. she wasn't allowed to work anymore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. That, that happened. My mum, and then when it came to her, you know, retirement, she wasn't entitled to a pension because she was still being measured off the man. Well, what did your husband earn? And then right. we decided, are you allowed to have a pension? So that's, <laughs> that's still that's still going on today. So, um, you know, like in my family, then I'm the first generation of a working mum, and we haven't got it right. We're still trying mm. to be, you know, the, the goddess who can bake love, beautiful fairy cakes on mm. one side, and you know, and, and look good, and, yeah. and and still be top of her career, and on the other side, and and you know women yeah. are burning out can't do it all. Yeah. Um, well i i think uh, i think the one piece of good news though is that uh, that the whole construct of work and how organized the organizations are are built and can, and formatted nowadays is changing and it's and i think it's the one thing that did come out of covid is realizing that this old idea of 9 to 5 coming into an office is it's fine it has its place for some people but for a lot of people uh, as you said is is Productivity and happiness. If people have more, you know, more flexible, or you're 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 able to be more flexible with their working environment. Maybe they want to work from home. Maybe they want to work different hours. And actually, that works okay if if you're willing to to accommodate it. And I think then people can live where they want if they can work remotely and all that. So I, I think there's a lot of things changing where, you know, people yeah. can have a job where you can get up and you can have breakfast with your kids and bring them to school and then work your, you know, work your work around that if you like and still be productive. Yeah, I think uh, in many ways, COVID accelerated things, you know, that, yep. for, that would otherwise have maybe taken uh, decades to bring in that level of flexibility into companies. Um, and and there's a whole change in, in mindset and in measurement, I think, of performance, mm -hmm. you know, that, yeah. um, because very often companies performance is, me is actually measured by 
by, you know, how many hours you put in rather than output. Um, <laughs> exactly. And of course, there's so much research to show that when your workers are happy, performance goes up. Um, yep. So if you can support your workers, then, and you can help people to be happier and well, then, uh, you know, where can you go wrong, really? Because performance improves and um, culture is going to be better and um, people are happier. The world is a better place because then kids yeah. are getting to see their parents as well. And yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's it impacts on the next generation. So, yeah, the, things are changing. And I think COVID accelerated some things greatly. Um, and we're in a, in a time of great flux really now and, and potentially great opportunity because things are not set back in stone mm. yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so now is the time we need to have, you know, th that kind of conscious thinking of what are we creating? Because COVID was, you know, the working from home thing was reactionary. Um, now we have the opportunity to go, OK, proactively, what do we want to create? What direction do we want to be going in? What do we know now is working and not working and and constantly remeasure, actually, as companies put in hybrid policies and, and test them out? The idea is to test them out and then reassess what's working, what's not working, rather than it just constantly being reactive to outer forces. Yeah, yeah, no, and it's great. I mean, um, our company here, I mean, we actually had run largely a virtual company even before COVID. And uh, and uh, nowadays we have people, like we have uh, one person who works for us in Slovakia, the project manager, is going to Thailand for two months, going to work from Thailand. It, yeah. It's fine for us. The work she does can be done from, it can be done from anywhere. So Absolutely. it's great for her. She's like, I want to get out of this brutal winter here and all the stuff going on. I want to go to Thailand. And we're going, yeah, all right, knock yourself out. Why not? Why not? Because <laughs> <laughs> people are realizing that there's, there's more to life than work. But what if you can have more to life and work? Yeah, exactly. So that, you know, so That's you can a beautiful, go yeah. to Thailand Ooh. and work. I'm going to gonna have, to, I'm gonna have, to, I'm gonna have to steal that one. Huh? <laughs> that's great well listen neve this has been fantastic i mean clearly we could go on for quite a long time and probably get into a lot of other subjects so hopefully you'll come back uh, again sometime and we can talk more um all of neve's information will obviously be below this video but before we go please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do Sure. Thank you, John. And it's been an absolute pleasure to have a conversation here today and I'm happy to come back. Um, so my website is nevehannon.com and I work primarily, I offer one-to-one -one coaching. I offer um, group programs for women. I will have uh, a new online program in early 2023, which will be really about getting clear, first of all, on your purpose and your mission. Um, so it's for people who are looking to leave a legacy, a positive legacy and make an impact on the world uh, and I'm going to have a three month program working on that um, so I have free purpose sessions coming up online um, if anybody would like to join uh, the easiest way is really just to subscribe to my on my website you just get a monthly newsletter I promise I don't bombard anybody um, <laughs> And I also work with companies, you know, internationally, globally. Um, so um, there's a lot on my website anyway. Just get in touch. I'm happy to have a conversation. Yeah, listen, fantastic. And I think really, really important work. And I go I encourage people to go to go check it out because, um, you know, now's the time. Now's the time to, you know, develop a little more self-awareness, you know, be more mindful. And, and just to be honest, like life's supposed to be enjoyed. It's not supposed to be a, a massive burden all the time. So, yes. you know, if, if, if it's feeling like that to you, then I'd definitely go go check out Neve's work. Thank you. All right. Well, yeah. Well, listen, thanks for being fantastic talking to you. Great to talk to somebody in Ireland. Uh, thank you all for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon.